It is an honor and a delight to be here with all of you this morning. I, uh, I love to be in congregations and have an opportunity to sense and to feel what God is doing. And my sense as we worship together today was the sense of the Holy Spirit coming and just resting upon us. The sense of the Holy Spirit giving opportunity for us to connect and to be able to be in a place together to worship the one true God. And I was thinking back through uh, my message as we were singing, and then as Jeff was uh, reading the story, now Jeff knew a little bit about what my message was about, right? But I thought, what an, what an, appropriate, what an appropriate story for what the Lord laid on my heart to share with all of you today. And we're in this season of, of, of Advent, of the coming of the Christ child, the, the one who was God, fully God, and yet was man, was a human being. And I think about th this good news of Jesus coming and this, this wow, this is so amazing. And this week I was, I was reading through an email and you'll see above me uh, the picture of a group of persons from Nigeria. Their, their name is actually the MB, M-B-E, people group. Uh, my brother and his, uh, his wife have worked with uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators for many years, worked in Papua New Guinea, now are back stateside working in, uh, in their, their member care. And he had forwarded this to me. And I was just amazed again by this miracle of the one who is worthy creator of the world who came into a humble earth, but even more so into a stable and I want you to just listen with me because as we start this message, I want us to think of it from the context of what we've just celebrated, what we've just remembered, and allow that to flow through our time as we, as we listen to the Word of God. As the Mbi translator, translation team in Nigeria was translating the Gospel of Luke, they came to chapter 2, verse 7, and she, Mary, gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. The translator took time to ponder how to translate some of the words, but not manger. They immediately used the word akpan. What's an akpan? asked the consultant John Waters. Tell me what it looks like. And one of the translators drew a picture on the whiteboard. It was essentially a cradle hung by ropes so that the newborn could be laid in it and swung. Read the translator's notes again, John suggested. What do the notes say about the manger? The translator's notes was a, sense, a series of commentaries in non-technical -techn English that are helpful for translation for those whom English is a second language. The B translator read the notes and saw that manger referred to an animal feeding trough. Sounds familiar, right? Even as the Mbi team re read the notes, they objected, we have always used the word okpan, we have used it for years, and that's what we should use. John pointed out to them that it wasn't just a matter of translation. God expects us to find the words that express the original meaning as accurately as possible. Furthermore, this word tells us something profound about God. When he came to live among us and bring salvation to us, he came in the lowliest possible way. He did not come and sleep in a nice okpan like every mbi mother wants for her newborn. Instead, he showed us his unbelievable humility. John told them, so we need to find the best word for an animal feeding trough. Suddenly, the one who had argued most loudly for the translation team, for the traditional team, offered, we feed our animals out of an old, worn-out basket that is not usable anymore except to feed the animals. We call it edzabri. Then try that term, said John. Put it in your rough draft and test it with the Mbi speakers. As the Mbi people listened, they were visibly moved. Picturing the newborn baby lying in the animal's feeding trough, they recognized in a new way that Jesus was willing to do whatever it took to reach them. As an adult, he would humble himself by washing the disciples' feet and then dying on the cross. And this humility started right from birth when he was born to a young peasant woman under questionable conditions. 
questionable social conditions and laid in an animal feeding trough. That is the Jesus that we talk about and that we celebrate. One who came and humbled himself and became obedient, it says in scriptures, even to death on the cross. Now that's good news. That's good news in any language, as it says in the PowerPoint. But the reality is, is that good news needs to be translated into our culture and into our context. And that's part of the challenge because right now, the world we live in doesn't have much good news. I don't even like to watch the local news or the world news. You know why? Because it's stacked up with one shooting after another shooting after another shooting. Now, that's the sensational stuff. I know there's other stuff that happens, but that's what's on the news. And then we've got shootings in schools, and we've got all kinds of things happening with, with terrorism activity and stuff. This is not a fun time to live, is it? You're allowed to have a little bit of a response from the audience. That's a, just You'll find out about me as bishop. I'm, I'm preaching, but I'm interacting with you as well. But it's not a fun time to live. It's depressing, and in the midst of that, it often saps our hope and our joy and our delight. And so I want today for us to focus, I'm just thinking about it, not only is the, the, the crisis that's out there, but right now we have, since World War II, the greatest refugee crisis that has been on, this, on the face of this earth. 60 million people displaced. They don't have their own home. That's depressing. It feels impossible to know how to do that. Not only that, for some of them, and right now a lot of them are in the Muslim world, our country doesn't even want them. Now, we're not going to get into politi political debates here, okay? I'm just simply saying our country doesn't want them. That was a statement. A recognition in the midst of that, we ask the question, what is the good news? What's the good news for you and me? And I think of that in the context of the words from the Apostle Paul in, first, in, in Colossians chapter 1. Uh, he says it this way, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I want us to turn to Colossians chapter 1 just briefly as a part of, 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 of this context. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, there was some of that that Jeff began to talk about in the, in the, in the children's story. By the way, anytime there's a children's story that's a good children's story, it should impact the adults as well because it's declaring truth, okay? Sometimes we understand it better in a children's story than we actually do in some other way but a recognition, Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Colossians, Paul it says here, writing with Timothy in the, in the context of Colossians 1, he's, he's beginning declaring and speaking these things out, and he says they've not stopped praying for them since the day they heard about them. He starts to intercede for them in the passage. He's actually writing a prayer, and then he says this. He's speaking about Jesus, verse 13. He is the image, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, verse, 13, uh, verse 15. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in, in your minds but because, of your, your, uh, but because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you to, by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And we could read on. But then the interesting shift is he's just declared who Jesus is and these things. And then in this context, in this particular space, he begins to make a shift, and he picks up with this verse, with this, this suffering verse in verse 24, and I'm going to be reading this from uh, the New Living Translation simply because there was something about how the words were put together that stirred something in my heart. First, this is, this is Colossians 1, 24 to 27, and I, I want you to 
to continue as you hear this, just to think about this declaration of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul speaking, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was a mystery for centuries and generations past, but now... Paul speaking to the church and to the Gentiles there, but now it has re been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you, Gentiles, as well, or too. The glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the mystery, the wonderful mystery that's there, is that Christ lives in you and me. And they say, well, we've known this for quite a while, Bishop Keith. You're not telling us anything new. No, I'm declaring what is true in the midst of the places where hope is broken because the truth is that we have in this earthen vessel, as Paul says, we have the very presence of Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit. This is good news. It's such good news that even though everything around us crumbles, we're able to respond in a way that says, you know what, yet I put my hope in him. During my time with Eastern Mennonite Missions, I had a variety of situations where I actually was able to visit the persecuted church, places where people were put in prison for their faith. And I remember saying, wow, how can you be in that space and place in prison for five years with your wife and children there to the church taking care of them because you can't help out and you continue to have a steadfast faith. And brother after brother after brother would tell me, you don't know what happened inside of me because the treasure of Jesus never left me. In fact, it only increased in those places of imprisonment. I said, I, I don't know if I would be able to, to be faithful and hold on. And they looked at me and they said, yes, you would, brother, because the, the Spirit of Jesus lives in you. And that's what would stir and come to the surface in those places of persecution. I've never been in that place. I don't really want to be in that place. But I trust God that that deposit that's been placed in me would come to life in the midst of those places of suffering and difficulty. And the treasure of Jesus would only increase even in those places of despair. That is our hope, brothers and sisters, that Christ lives in us. But I want us to, 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 to better understand what this means and so I invite us to reflect back on the God of history. Actually, to do this, I'm borrowing from Craig Nettle and Alex Absalom in the River Tree Church in Ohio. Um, one of their most, their very missional church, reaching out, engaging in those ways. And one of the ways in which they've done that is through a tool they call napkin discipleship. You might say, wow, napkin discipleship. You're really getting technical now, Keith. But napkin discipleship is simply involving, it is involving a series of drawings that everyone can sketch on a napkin, in a local Starbucks, at a McDonald's, or even in their own home. Simple, and simple is good. And they've called this tool one of. This is the tool that's up in front of you here. A simple pictogram that allows people to grasp the heart of God. Nothing complex, but simple and easily drawn and redrawn and understood. And I'd like us to look at this simple tool as a way of reviewing our understanding of God's interaction with humanity and his heart for humanity throughout history. So let's start from the far left with four. As you draw this particular thing, and any one of us could draw that little smiley face, right? Uh, you all can draw that? Let's, let's just see a show of hands. How many could draw a smiley face? Okay, we're, we're in. We're all in because it's not that hard. But a simple drawing of that, of that smiley face, because God is for people. God throughout history has been for humanity, not against them. And yet the way it's depicted, or the ways in which we read it, we say, wow, God doesn't like them, or God doesn't love these people. It has more to do with our response than it does to do with the God who created us. John 3.16, that we know well, says God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son that anyone who believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent his Son into the world not to what? Not to judge or condemn the world, but to that the world would be saved through him, right? That's the plan. That's what's in God's heart, because God is for us. And through history, 
He's demonstrated his, his loving and steadfast presence in the lives of the children of Israel. God is for people. The smiley face with the halo represents God, but God being for people was not enough. And so God wasn't only for us, but he was also with us. We see this in the beginning of the Old Testament. God is with the nation of Israel as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God is with Moses as he speaks to him through a burning bush. God is with Joshua as Israel prepares to conquer the land. God was with Daniel in the lion's den. God was with Elijah on the mountain. And the list goes on and on. God was with his people. And God being with us is certainly better than God being for us, although I actually would choose both of them because I think they're really both important. But God is still very different from us. And this is the part that always amazes me. God for us, God with us, he's still way out there. We're not able to kind of, it's hard to access, and we, like, we pray, and I think he hears, but he's so far away. And his holiness and his otherness and his, is, is an unbridgeable barrier. And th therefore, most of us feel sad in his presence. And that's the little sad face with the baseball cap on there. That represents you and me, not understanding the depth of this God that wants to interact and connect with us. So God being for and even being with people was still not enough. And you guess where I'm going. God didn't stop there. There's even better news in Jesus. God becomes one of us. Colossians 2, 9 says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body. He came and lived among us. This is, this is Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. He came as an infant, fully God and fully man. And you know what? Our minds will never understand that one. What limitations did he have? We don't fully understand what no limitations mean, so we have a hard time grasping what some limitations are. But he restricted his capacity and became one of us. Eugene Peterson in the message um, uh, says it this way from John when it talks about the word came and, and dwelt among us. And he says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Just like not so long ago, Jeff and Katie became flesh and blood in the sense that they were not in Lancaster City. They moved into the neighborhood. They're present here. One of. Not distant and other than, but one of. Jesus lived as one of us. Jesus loved as one of us. And he even liked us while he was here, and he likes us now because of who he is. That's the essence of the Christmas story. It's, it's what we just came through was this reality of how God sees us, how God, how God humbled himself and came so that he could show us the way of love and peace. He became one of us. God in Jesus put on the baseball cap as good as it is to know that God is for us and with us. It amazes us that God became one of us. And, and again, this is really simple, and I don't want it to be sacrilegious, but you understand what I'm saying. If we would depict ourselves as human beings as the little kid with the baseball cap on, that's exactly what he did. And he came and he became one of us because he wanted to show us what the Father really was like. Is that good news? That's a pretty good response, but I'll say it again. Is that good news? Yeah. Amen. It's wonderful news. The challenge is I don't always live up to the fullness of that because I get restricted by my understanding of how big God is and the ways in which he's working. But now we come to the best part. This is all good. But when we understand the implications of God being for us, with us and one of us, that often is the place that we're compelled to invite Jesus to be in us. And that changes everything. That's the game changer. God himself passes the DNA of Jesus into our very lives, which empowers us to live as Jesus here on the earth, just like the story of the red tractor. The very 
essence of Christ is poured into us as we open ourselves up and say, I surrender. I want to walk with you, God. Being with us, being for us, being one of us pales in comparison to God being in us. We are now walking around like little Jesuses, and I'm not saying we're Jesus. I'm saying the essence and DNA and presence of Jesus is within us, in the person of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised, and we are able to go around and interact with people from that very nature. It's good news. And I'll tell you what, it's hard to live that way. Because my old flesh, as my mom always called me Keithy, so I'm still Keithy around my mom. My mom's not doing well health-wise, kind of on her way into glory, but she still loves to see Keithy. The reality is that the old Keithy, my nature, always wants to rise up and take over and rule rather than surrendering each day. That's why it's hard. Because every day I have a choice. Do I want Jesus to live through me or do I want my life to be the way I want it? Every day I have that choice. But it means that like God, we must be for people. And we need to think of ways that we can show that we're for them, not against them. That we as a church are not against the world and the people in the world. And they're closely connected, so you have to be careful how you talk. How you talk. But we are for them. About seven years ago, there was a book, a book written by the Barna Institute called Unchristian. And they listed all the things that the world around us perceives how we think. And you know what? Not one of them is for. They're all against the world. Now, I'm against the enemy's tactics and against the ways in which he destroys people in the world, but I can never communicate that I'm against people. I am for them. And we need to be creative as a church to say, God, show us how we can be for the people around us and that they know it. We need to be with them. We have to spend time with the people around us. And one of the challenges of church, and I'll just call it church in terms of I pastored for, for 10 years, is the challenge of we, we, we get so caught up in all the programs of what we're doing that we have precious little time to actually be with people that don't yet know Jesus. And so we have to say, how do we turn this on its head and say, which priorities do we work with and be the church in the midst of the challenges? And I'm not figuring this out for you at East Pete. I'm, I'm just a bishop, okay? I don't do those figure out things. But I'm simply declaring what I, I believe to be true. And that's the pastors and it's you as a body. But he also empowers me to be one of, to be among them. Now, you might notice I'm, I'm not dressed in the most stunning bishop garb. I could have worn my gown, but I didn't bring it. But there's a reason for that. Most times when I go to church, I don't dress up a lot. And there's a reason for that because as I've interacted with people around me in the community, people literally told me, we don't have things that are good enough to come to your church. And so I'm not saying it or telling people we began to change a culture at Mountville where how we dressed was very similar to how other people would dress to come to a gathering. Now, that's not always understood because I grew up in an era and tradition. You know what? I'm going to preach over time because I'm, going to, I'm starting to get into a whole bunch of other stuff, but I'll, I'll, I'll land it, Bob. Um, a recognition that I grew up in an era where there was something about coming into God's presence and honoring Him with the way I dressed and knowing that this was a special set-apart place. And I, I know that and I believe that. But I believe there's also this thing of God saying, and I want, to, I want you to be so creative that the way in which you work creates space that anybody could walk into your gathering on a Sunday morning and feel welcome and at home and feel like they're one of. I don't have the answers on that one either. I'm, I'm a pilgrim on a pathway saying, God, I want you to teach me. I want you to show me how. That means that God, like God, we must be for people, with people, one of the people, so that the DNA of Jesus can pass through our lives into the lives of others, and Jesus will have the opportunity to live in them. That's our whole task, brothers and sisters. As followers of Jesus, as disciples, the task is to allow the Lord to do that through us, to become disciples that make disciples. It's a very big responsibility. 
And how can we possibly do that well? We are so weak, so human, so unlike Jesus in so many ways. But that brings me to the crucial, crucial point of this message and where I will eventually land it, Robert. And that is that when Jesus was here, he promised us that he would send the Holy Spirit. And I, don't, I still don't understand the Holy Spirit the whole way. I really don't. All I know is that Jesus said he would come and live in me. And he told the early disciples, wait until that point before you go out and do ministry. And then you'll know it. And they knew it when it happened. He will come and the presence of Christ will live in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. And then you'll be able to be about the work that I did. Even greater things than I did, you will do. That's the call in the church. But it's not because of you and me or that we're so righteous or religious or, or wonderful, gifted people. It's because of the presence of Jesus in us. That's why. In closing, I invite you to turn to John 14 with me. And because of time, I'm glad all of you can read, and I don't have to read this whole text for you. John 14. It starts out, verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. This is the declaration. Church at East Pete and at wherever else it's gathered, church, do not be troubled. Do not be troubled in this day and age with all the stuff around us. Why? You put your trust in God. You surrender to Jesus because no matter what the context, he is able to work through that situation to draw people to himself. Again, I remember Chinese leaders. We just found out that the, another one of their pastors was, was placed in, the, in prison. This is probably 10 years ago. And we're like, oh, another one of your pastors in prison. And so a bunch of leaders at EMM started praying. And they're like, Lord, help this person get out. And they rebuked us. And they said, don't you ask that they get out one day before God wants them to, because if he has them in prison, he's going to use them there. Excuse me. <laughs> but they were right. I pray for my comfort most of the time because I want to be comfortable. I want everything to be nice. And I have a little secret to tell you, walking in the kingdom with Jesus doesn't mean that everything is nice in a nice little package. It just means that he's always with you and he always lives in you. John 14 uh, was going to read this passage, but I'll let you, that's your, that's your homework assignment for the rest of the day is read John 14. Actually, while I'm at it, because I'm giving assignments, read John 14, 15, and 16. And then if that's not enough, read all of John. That's, no, it's not. But John 14 in particular, this sense of God calling us to this place where he, Jesus speaking to the disciples, says this in verse 16. And again, remembering the concepts of, of four, one, uh, one of and in. Verse 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor, Paracletos, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the one who, who, who is your counselor, your advocate, one to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The, wor the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will see you, will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. This is good news, folks. Nothing has changed about this equation other than we live in a world that's constantly trying to get our attention somewhere else away from the fact that the very presence of Jesus still lives in those who have surrendered and follow him. Hasn't changed. The last verse in, in uh, this particular passage, not at the end of 14, but verse 27 from the New Living Translation says it this way, I'm leaving you with a gift. This is the Holy Spirit, but I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart and the peace I give as a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Church at East Pete, don't be troubled or afraid. Because the Spirit of Jesus lives in you. I'd like to close today with this question in front of us. 
God, in what ways are you calling me to surrender anew to Jesus Christ and to the work of the Holy Spirit in this coming year? In what ways are you calling me? Not the person beside you, not your spouse, not that one over there that bugs you that you wish they would change. Let the Holy Spirit work with them. But in what ways, in what ways are you calling me to surrender anew to Jesus Christ and to the work of the Holy Spirit in this coming year? I'm comfortable with silence. And so we're just going to sit with that question for a few, for a few I was going to say a few minutes, and I always say a few moments because that's safer. But we're going to sit in silence with this question. And I invite you just to ask the Holy Spirit, in what ways are you calling me to surrender anew to Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit in this coming year? Trust that the Spirit is prompting and stirring in you and may continue in this, in this benedictory song. We're going to watch, actually, a song. Some of you may know it. If you want to sing it, you're free to do that. Though I would encourage you simply to reflect on the words that you're hearing in this. It's called Jesus, Hope of the Nations. It's a declaration about the one who gives us hope. And if the, if the Spirit of God spoke to you in any specific way and you would, and you would value being prayed for, I just invite you to come to the front, stand or to kneel, whatever, and I'm going to pray for all of you, for all of us as a, benedict a benedictory prayer. But uh, there's something at times where there's something stirring, we're actually coming forward and being a part of, uh, uh, of a response that also provides an accountability to go to someone and say, this is what I was asking for. And I just really, I really want to, I want to keep, keep accountable. So we're just going to, we're just going to uh, listen to this song Sing along if it really is stirring in your heart. But as it's playing, if you would value prayer or there's something you want to, you want to drive in a stake of something that God spoke to you in, re in reference to that question, I invite you to just come forward and stand here, kneel, kneel here, and then I will pray for all of us, including those up front, uh, in the prayer benediction. <laughs> 